In Iran, grief and despair. The death toll in the earthquake is now estimated at 35,000. In Canada, an attempt to hold the country together collapses, a fight over language and culture. And in this country, AIDS. Are we spending too much to fight it and not enough to combat other diseases? This is NBC Nightly News, reported by Garrick Utley. Good evening. The earth shook again today in Iran. There were more strong aftershocks of the earthquake, which has killed tens of thousands of people there. What is happening there is not only a tragedy, we have seen that, it has also attested the Iranian government's ability to deal with it. Arthur Kent has today's report from the scene. Most of the families in this farming and fruit growing region lived close to the earth. Now they turn the soil and debris of their homes in a harvest of despair. Although the cry for help has been heard around the world, the rescue effort here hasn't been quick enough or large enough for many victims. One reason, the remote, rugged terrain. Iranian military aircraft have ferried medical and other emergency supplies into the area, but road transport, vital to moving in the huge amount of heavy equipment needed, has been disrupted by landslides. Iranian authorities are keeping tight control on just who helps them and how. Western diplomats say the last thing the government of Iran wants is to appear to be incapable of managing this relief effort on its own. After more than a decade of strictly enforced isolation, the government here, though in desperate need of help, has agonized over throwing open its borders to foreign specialists, causing delays to rescue teams arriving from abroad. President Hashimi Rafsanjani, who toured quake-damaged villages yesterday, has reportedly taken personal control of the emergency. He has insisted, some diplomatic sources say, that Iran be mobilized along the religious and paramilitary lines created in the years since the late Ayatollah Khomeini's Islamic Revolution. Most locally donated relief supplies are collected at neighborhood mosques. The army and the Revolutionary Guards oversee the distribution of goods and the clearing of damaged roads. But there is some bitterness that the people, not the armed forces, did most of the early rescue work, often with their bare hands. More than 6,000 people have been pulled alive from the rubble and hospitalized, but the number of people rescued dropped sharply today. Tomorrow, a fourth and now much less hopeful day of combing through the debris for survivors. As the death toll climbs, international rescue specialists are still arriving but it is feared arriving too late. Arthur Kent, NBC News, Gilan Province, Iran. And now from devastation to divisiveness, from Iran to Canada. Canada today is a divided nation and it is headed for a very serious crisis. The reason, a clash of cultures, one English, the other French, and it begins in the province of Quebec. Quebec, the largest and second most populous of Canada's ten provinces, is in many ways a nation within a nation. It was settled by Frenchmen, not Englishmen. Today it remains 80% French-speaking. In 1967, during a visit, French President Charles de Gaulle was cheered when he said, Vive le Quebec libre, long live free Quebec. A decade later, the provincial leader René Lévesque launched a drive for independence. It was voted down in a referendum. The Canadian government, led by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, recognized that Quebec is different and tried to give it special status. But last night, that effort fell apart. In Toronto, Henry Chan. It is a staggering personal blow for Canada's Prime Minister, a confident shaker for the country. Canadians everywhere stopped to listen as he broadcast today to the nation. We have suffered today, and there are potentially significant implications for Canada, because actions do have consequences. Listening Canadians know those consequences could be the breakup of the country. I feel very badly for Canada. I'm sure that other countries view us as a backward nation now. Not backward, but certainly divided. Polls show a majority of Quebecers favor a break with Canada. This provincial flag on the young man's sleeve is only one sign of a growing nationalism. It comes in the face of widespread irritants directed at Quebec by English-speaking Canadians. The booing of French during the national anthem at a Toronto baseball game. <laughs> 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 
anti-French language demonstrations at the country's parliament buildings. The white Anglo-Saxon people, right, are, are the uh, colonizers of this country. And there was an incident during a demonstration near Ottawa when English zealots walked on a Quebec flag. And in the end, English-speaking people wouldn't give Quebec special considerations for French language or their cultural use. Immediately, Canadians are concerned about foreign reaction. The dollar has slipped only marginally during this debate, but no one is certain what will happen when markets open on Monday. To our friends and partners abroad, I urge that this situation be kept in perspective. Canadians have always overcome challenges to our unity, and we shall do so again. Later today, Quebec's Premier Robert Barassa said the province is finished with constitutional conferences and he appointed a special committee to study Quebec's options. Language has long been an issue here, but today there is a widespread feeling that a major as yet uncertain step has been taken, that Quebec and the rest of the country will never be the same again. Garrick? Well, Henry, you are a Canadian. Tell us, what do you think will happen now? Will the country come apart? Well, Garrick, these language crises have been with us ever since the inception of the country, but there is a difference. Ten years ago, there was a referendum in Quebec. The province voted to stay within Confederation. People at the time thought that there might be some fear of economic reprisal, a loss of jobs, perhaps a loss of some foreign investment. But the Quebecer today, when you ask him, will you take the step of separation in order to protect your language and your culture, he looks at you and says, why not? Garrick? Henry Champ in Toronto, thank you. And as we cover our world this day, we'll go next to the Soviet Union, where Mikhail Gorbachev was talking tough today. And in this country, we'll go to Iowa. The next presidential election is more than two years away, but already a new political face was testing the political waters there today. Thank you very much. Ooh, I love the taste of crab delights from Lewis Kemp, crab delights tonight. It's a seafood paradise, crab delights tonight. Crab delights from Lewis Kemp, so easy, so delicious, right out of the package in your favorite dish. Can't help this love of mine, now I have seafood anytime. Now you can enjoy the great taste of lobster tonight with lobster delights from Lewis Kemp. A shame. It will never catch on in America. And the taste is incredible. But you'll never get past the name. Muselix is too European. You Americans like labels. Shredded wheat, cornflakes, no surprises. This taste is always a surprise. It's crisp, nutty, and sweet with fruit. Oh. Much too exotic for the American palate. Kellogg's Muselix. Over 50 million boxes sold in America. At Cape Canaveral today, a Titan III rocket roared into space, carrying with it and successfully deploying a privately owned communication satellite that can handle 120,000 telephone calls and three TV channels simultaneously. A similar relay station was launched in March. That one went into a useless orbit. Back on Earth, nine days from today in Moscow, there will be a very important meeting of the Soviet Communist Party. And one of the questions that will be answered there is this. Can Mikhail Gorbachev hold on to power both as president of the Soviet Union and party leader? Does he want to? The Soviet leader is coming under very heavy pressure from conservatives in the party, and today one of them won a significant victory. But Gorbachev is standing firm. In Moscow, Bob Abernathy. Gorbachev made it clear he wants to remain, for now, both president of the Soviet Union and general secretary of its Communist Party. For the time being, we need to preserve the situation as it is. All week in the new party congress of the Russian Federation, Gorbachev has been under attack. His conservative rival, Yegor Ligachev, suggested he should quit as party secretary. And so did many rank-and-file delegates. If he remains president, he should resign as general secretary. It's physically impossible to carry the two loads. The largely conservative Russian party delegates complained about the failed economy and Gorbachev's plan for free markets. They accused Gorbachev of weakening Soviet military security and of spending too much time as president on international affairs, not enough on problems at home.
But Gorbachev defended his record and appealed vigorously for party unity. That unity may be strained by the election today as General Secretary of the Russian Party of Ivan Poloskov, a conservative critic of many of Gorbachev's policies. But Poloskov said he does not want Gorbachev to give up his party job. Week after next, at the Congress of the Communist Party of the entire Soviet Union, conservatives are expected to continue their sharp attacks on Gorbachev, but he says he will not step down, not now. Bob Abernethy, NBC News, Moscow. And in the Middle East today, Israel says that at least two gunmen were killed today when an Israeli gunboat sank a Palestinian boat off the southern Lebanese coast. A similar incident three weeks ago prompted the Bush administration to break off talks with the PLO. Back in this country, Nelson Mandela, on the second stop of his eight-city U.S. tour, got a hero's welcome in Boston today. At the Kennedy Library, Senator Edward Kennedy introduced him as the statesman of our time. Mandela, in turn, thanked the Kennedys for their support and paid tribute to Boston's huge Irish population. I feel particularly honored by your presence. In fact, right now, I consider myself an honorary Irishman from Soweto. The Mandela visit to Boston was to have been a high point in the life of one South African teenager, but as Brad Willis reports, one dream turned to disappointment this afternoon. Great. Okay. And Dabi Mabuza has been in physical therapy, hoping to summon her strength, pull herself to her feet, and meet Nelson Mandela. Hopefully, I'll be able to stand up and greet him standing up. She is a 16-year-old South African girl who knows all too well the pain of apartheid. Once you oppose them and you, you believe, you know, in non-racism, they want to kill you as South Africa, you know. And Tabi was just a child when her family was targeted for death because of her parents' involvement in the African National Congress. They were living in exile in neighboring Botswana four years ago when South African commandos attacked their home. And Tabi took seven bullets in her stomach and back. I got paralyzed and I can't feel my legs from the waist down. <laughs> Ever since that day, Ntabi has been struggling to get back on her feet. Her source of strength and inspiration is Nelson Mandela. Today, at this rally, Ntabi hoped to rise into her walker and greet Mandela. But it was not to be. The motorcade was late. Ntabi was overcome by the heat and had to be hospitalized before Mandela arrived. Hours later, Ntabi recovered. The moment that she had longed for was gone, but Mandela's presence here was good enough. And it just feels so proud even watching him on TV, and I know he's doing a good job, so. Brad Willis, NBC News, Boston. Tomorrow, Mandela moves on to Washington, D.C.